In this video, I'm going to be showing you how you can go about creating a grab system in Unreal Engine 4 in VR. This is not a built from scratch video showing you how to create a specific system. Rather, I will be breaking down all of the logic you need to make sure that you walk away from this video knowing everything you need to build and expand your very own grab system. Throughout this video, I will be explaining every variable and every function in a typical grab system, some of the things you may want to incorporate into your own system, and I will go through multiple examples of different objects created using the system that I've set up to showcase here today. Those being a holdable object, a climbable object, and a door that's set up to be dragged open and closed in VR. I have never made a video quite like this before, and it is a lot more work than I had anticipated, so I hope it's enjoyable to watch and that you learn something useful. With all of that out of the way, let's get started. So, I guess the first thing that we should talk about here is the blueprint interface. There are only two functions, and they are grab and let go. Grab here takes an actor for the hand and a primitive component for the grabbed component. It also returns a bool for success. Let go here takes an actor for the hand, no component necessary, and it also returns success. This is very helpful because as you'll see in a moment, all of the grabbables are set up in a parent-child hierarchy, and this allows for some easy integration for new object types. For now, let's take a look at the grabbable actor. This is the parent of all actors that can be grabbed. As you can see, there is nothing in this actor's event graph, and that's because everything it does is simply setup and placeholding. Here, you can see all the variables stored in this actor. These are all the variables we'll need for every grabbable actor. Rather than duplicate objects or repeat logic, we'll store all of that right here, and then we can simply derive from it for all the higher level classes. I'll go more into each one as we dive into the graph. The main reason for this is to have the base set up for the grab and let go functions that come with the blueprint interface. This will store the hand actor to the local variable and check to see if the object already has a primary hand set. This will just confirm to see if the object is already being held. You can also see here that after completing its task, it'll return a local bool for its success state. This will return false unless set true. Next, I'm checking to see if the object supports two-handed grabbing, and if it does, I have not set anything up for that. This is simply an example to show how a system like this works. We're just assuming everything can be grabbed with one hand. Then, we also check to see if the object can be toggle grabbed. If it can't, nothing happens here on purpose, just because it's already being held. If it can be toggle grabbed, before grabbing it with the new hand, we must cast the hand to its class, then release the actor, which is essentially just setting the hand's held actor reference to null. Then, this meets up at assigning the hand with the earlier check to see if the primary hand was valid or not, from the is not, and it assigns the hand and sets the local success bool, which as you saw at the beginning of this section, gets returned as a success state. As you can see here, let go is a little more straightforward. It's the same structure with the sequence and returning the local success bool, but when you let go of an object, it can really only happen one way, so there's no excessive check set up here. So as you can see here, I have two objects. The big one is the parent grabbable, and the small one on top is a holdable actor. I'll show you the logic for the holdable actor in a minute, but I want to show you this first to really explain what's going on so you can fully understand how to set this up for yourself. When I hover my hand over the grabbable object here, you'll see that the hand changes to a hovering animation. In the logic of the hand, this just happens whenever the hand has a potentially grabbable object. However, when I grab it, nothing's happening. This is because the object is storing its references, but there's nothing telling it what to do with those references. When I grab the holdable object here, you can see that it snaps to the hand and follows it. This particular one has toggle grab enabled, so it can actually snap from hand to hand. This is done using a physics constraint, so when you let go, it actually does also apply some degree of physics to the object. As well, I have a sphere trace and grab trace set up, so objects can be picked up from a distance, and this is toggleable in the parent class. Looking at the holdable object's grab function here, after setting the use hand, which is really the only part we do repeat, we then call the parent function to set up the hand references for the object. This also allows us to skip the holding logic entirely if the parent grab function returns not successful. 
Like I said, this is done using a physics constraint, so I did set up a function to set up the constraints when grabbing. It needs the use hand, and it also needs to cast it to the class. Then, before the constraint can be set up, it needs to set the object's location and rotation based on the cube, which is just a helper mesh in the hand for the grab point. It also adds a rotation offset, which is another setting in the parent class. This allows for having objects that might have weird pivots being set up more easily, especially for testing purposes. After that, it sets the constrained components of the physics constraint and tells the parent capsule to ignore itself when moving. This could be done on the character, but I chose to do it here as it keeps the logic together. My project is going to be single player, but as you can see here, I'm using the player index of the motion controller to get the player character. This would be one way of detecting a player for a multiplayer setup. Finally, it disables the collisions between the capsule and the static mesh of the holdable object to make sure that when you move the object into your own capsule, it doesn't stop or do anything like that. The way I'm doing it here is done with a plugin I purchased, which is very helpful for doing physics detection in Unreal Engine. However, if you don't have the $10 to put out for it, it still is really easy to do just by having the static mesh ignore the pawn's physics channel. The downside to this, however, is it does mean it ignores every pawn, even enemies and stuff like that, so it could be a little weird for weapons. Typically setting up disabling collisions between two objects does require writing C++, but it is still possible to do for free if you can write C++ and you wanted to look into something like that. Just like the parent class, the let go function is very simple, and it does also have a function in it for releasing the constraints, which again is just a simpler version of the grab counterpart reversing its actions. Still nothing on the event graph in this actor either, just because it does follow the physics constraint. Because the door is quite complicated, I just want to show another example of how this can be used to create an object that does something completely different, and I promise I'm not going to waste too much of your time. So for that, we're just going to take a quick look at the climbable object. As you can see, it has the exact same structure for grab here. It sets the used hand, calls the parent function, starts a sequence, checks if the parent was successful, and returns the success spool at the end. However, since setting up the logic for the grab system in the object itself means it can really only manage following one hand at a time, if the player grabs a climbable while they're holding another one, the original climbable will be released. Then, I'm setting the pivot location to the world location of the motion controller, which as you can see on the left is simply a helper component with a cube on it, and this keeps track of the point the player is pivoting around for the climb. As well, it also disables collisions between the player capsule and the climbable, which again, if you don't have this plugin, it can just be easily done by having the climbable ignore the pawn channel. Don't forget to include a local success pool so it returns true. The let go function here actually is a little interesting, because when the player lets go of the object, instead of having it just drop dead to the ground, they get launched based on the custom stored velocity, which gets clamped to avoid it being too strong. If you wanted to mess around with this, you could change the value of the make literal float node and just try to increase the intensity of the effect. Then we get to the familiar ending part of the sequence. Here you can see that on the event graph this time there is an event tick, and it's first checking to see if the primary hand is valid. With the way that I have my system set up, this is just the easiest way to detect if the object is being held by a hand. Only if the object is being held, It'll add an offset to the owner of the hand, equal to the displacement between the pivot location and the motion controller. When subtracting one vector from another like this to get a displacement, it's always good to remember the order should be target minus movie. Here you can also see the calculation for the stored velocity value when letting go. It's quite simple. It just gets the displacement between the actor and the last checked location, then after calculating it updates that last checked location. This is a quick and dirty way of calculating the velocity of an object, but it works quite well for a system like this. Previously I said it should always be structured target minus movie, yet here you can see the players actually on top. This is just the way that I was able to get it to work, 
Sometimes when dealing with vector math, you do just have to try and try again. So, as you can see when I grab one of these climbable objects, it puts the pivot location where the hand is. This can be hidden, but it's currently turned on just for visualization. Now, when I move the hand around, it's offsetting the player rather than the hand itself. As I grab each new object, it is releasing the old one. However, the hand stays closed just because the animation is set up to be based on if the grip is held down. This is intentional. As well, you can see the object start to jitter. This is because it's only set to ignore the collision of the player's capsule while it's being held. In hindsight, if you're setting something like this up, you'll probably want to make it so that it ignores the player's capsule on begin play. Which is easy enough to set up for a single player game. However, in a multiplayer game, just to remind you, you are going to want to load the player in using a custom player start object, which can save a reference to the player's hands, which as you may recall, just has that player index value stored on it. Speaking of index, this index finger has a sphere on it. There is just one more thing I want to show off before moving on to the doors, and this is just a simple object not related to the grab system itself that's going to showcase the main mathematical problem when dealing with things in VR. Like I said, this object is not related to the grab system, so it is going to be structured a little differently. On the event graph here, you can see that on play, it stores the idle location and its current location. It is also setting up a dynamic material, this is just because it will glow when it's triggered. Then, on event tick, we once again check to see if the object has a primary hand, but you may notice if you look over to the left where the variables are, there is no secondary hand option. That is just because the button will only ever respond to one finger at a time. The first thing I'll show you is what happens when it's not valid, because it simply just returns itself to its idle position. So you can see that it is interpolating between its current position, and its idle position, still storing the current location for later use. Then, it also checks to see when the object stops being triggered, and resets the bool and dynamic material. To show you this as well, the get is being triggered function is just getting the displacement between the button and the trigger location, which is a helper object set up by moving the button to its lowest point in the scene view, and setting the target location object to that point. It then gets the up vector of the button and projects the displacement on that up vector. Then I have it split and I'm only taking the z-axis. This right here is that nugget of information I was talking about with VR math, projecting vectors to the right orientation. This allows you to have objects in any rotation react to displacement as if they are happening on a relative axis and it's very powerful. If the primary hand is valid, then the object just needs to know if it's being triggered or not. If it is, it just sets the bool and dynamic material, and it also runs the trigger action. Keep in mind, there is a bit of an issue here. There should be a do once node before the trigger action, which does get reset during the object's return to its idle position. If it's not triggered, it'll calculate the current travel of the button, which as you can see here is the displacement between the point press sphere on the character's hand and the initial press location. This then gets projected onto the button's up vector, which once again just makes sure that regardless of the rotation of the object in the world, whether it's on a wall, on a table, or even on a ceiling, it'll always do the math in the proper orientation. We then use the absolute value of that displacement vector's length, and multiply that by the button's up vector. This is used as a displacement for the button's initial location, which is stored upon overlap to make sure that the button is being accurately displaced. This is just another way of doing the same thing as I was doing earlier, and depending on the intended purpose, you'll want to use one over the other. Now to the overlap functions. These are just casting the incoming actor to the hand, and if it's valid, adjusting the primary hand reference, and upon initial overlap also sets that initial press location and button location. Now, I think you should know everything you need to know to be able to understand the door itself. So let's take a look at that. I'll start off the door here by showing the main difference and the power of the parent-child grabbable system. Here is a look at the event graph of the door as I have it set up currently. To start with something everyone's probably familiar with, here is the logic for opening, closing, and resetting the door. It is just done with simple timelines, and they lerp the door from the grab rotation 
to the desired rotation based on which of the events was triggered. The whole thing is connected at the end with a node that enables collisions. This is because when we are letting go of the object, we are disabling the collisions so the door can clip through the player while doing its animation. To take a look at the let go function here for a moment, this will also do a decent job of showing how flexible this system really is. Where the previous objects really had nothing significant in their let go function, this object does quite a lot. Here we can see that the door will trigger the correct event depending on the door's current travel. This will make a little bit more sense as we dive into the math, but this happens on let go because while we're holding onto the door, the rotation is dragging along with the motion controller's movement. Here, you can see the main body of the math and that the whole thing is being clamped to the maximum travel. This is an adjustable value that allows you to limit how much the door will move before being let go of. However, it can be set to the door's open amount, which does mean you can drag it fully. This is simply here because of a mechanic I'm implementing for myself. However, you can just replace this with the door open amount if you'd like. Connected to those are projected vectors, which are the offset between the drag origin and the drag location. This will get the offset between where the door is grabbed and where it should be, and it will be projected on either the right or forward vector depending on whether or not the door is open. Now, before any of that happens, we have to set the world location of the drag helper object, and this is the part that gets really complicated, so if you need to write down the formula on paper or watch the section a couple of times, that is totally understandable. It starts off by getting the hand and casting it to the motion controller, and then getting the offset between that location and the location of the drag origin, which is a similar helper object to the pivot location in the climbable objects. Then, like in the other section, you can see that I'm projecting that offset to both the right and the forward vectors, and then adding the same offset value from the origin's world location right now. This will find the offset, then make sure the calculation is happening where it actually should be in world space. These final values are being used to make a vector from the drag location, with either the X or the Y being set in its respective axis calculation. Then, you can see that it's being fed into a select vector, checking to see if the door is open or not. So if you stop for a minute and you think about how the door is when it's closed, you are pulling it toward you to open it. This translates to being the object's forward axis in its relative space. Now, think about how the door looks when it's open, but keep yourself oriented the same. The door would now kind of be to your left, and to close the door, you're no longer pulling it toward you, you're pulling to the right. Because of this, we must project the calculation on a different axis depending on where the door's starting state is. Let's just take one more look at the door rotation calculation for a moment, because I want to explain some simplification as well. I have all of this math set up here so that it's easily visible for the video, but when you do things like this for yourself, you're going to want to identify the sections of math that you're going to want to reuse a lot, and then create some getter functions. Here, I'm going to create a function that will return the projected vectors for the drag origin and the drag location on both axes. And the easiest way to do this is just to drag off to the return node, copy in the logic you want to be able to easily reuse, keeping in mind to avoid any parts that might be specific to that case, and then connect the pins to the return node, and then if you need to, you can just go through and change the names, but in this case, return value x and return value y work out pretty nice. Now, we can just take this function over there and connect the pins where they need to go. Just make sure that you remember to set it to pure. Now, let's just take a quick look at the grab function. There is actually not much going on here. It's just about the same as all the others, except for the fact that we are using the grabbed component to make sure that the door is being grabbed by the handle. If the door mesh you're using has a connected handle and it's all one mesh, this can still be done by stretching a cube across both the handles and then having it set to hidden in game. It also checks to make sure that the door is not in use, and this is just to make sure that the door's animation cannot be interrupted. It also does pass the grabbed component back to the parent, which isn't being used currently, but it's always better to be safe. As well, it has the same structure with the sequence ending in the success pool. 
The main part of the grab here, just to make sure I don't leave anything out, is simply setting the helper object's world locations and having the capsule ignore the door while moving. The door will already clip through the player as it's being dragged, however if the player starts to walk around inside the door it will cause some issues with the player's movement component calculations, so this must be set to ignored in this case. Finally, it also sets the door's grab rotation you saw earlier, and sets the door to being used so it cannot be grabbed again until it's let go of, and its animation has finished playing. Also remember to set that successful. And I have already shown most of the let go function here in passing, but just to explain it fully, you can see that the sequence here is still happening before the branch, even though there is a good bit of logic happening here without the branch's influence. That is just because the logic past the branch is the only part of the logic that requires the hand to be calculated. Everything else has already been cached when the object was grabbed, and it can only be let go of if it was grabbed initially. This way, the success state is still dependent on whether or not the object is being let go of by a hand, yet the door will still be able to finish resetting its variables and itself if needed. Thank you so much for watching my video. I really hope it was entertaining and that you were able to understand all of the ins and outs of making a grabbing system in VR. I didn't discuss the hands themselves in this video, but that is a topic I will be discussing in another video I have planned coming in the near future. Though for the meantime, if it helps, the hands provided with the VR template do contain just about all the logic needed for this system, and the trace grab is just done using multiple line traces to make sure that any object within a radius gets detected for the hand. It's also directed using the skeletal mesh's forward axis, then the endpoint is translated using projected vectors to somewhat bring it down and inward, so the angle is more related to the palm of the hand going forward. I have really enjoyed working in VR, but the entry point is quite high unless you're willing to spend a bit of money, so I really hope the knowledge that I've picked up over the last month will serve you well, and I hope you have a great day. Take care.